Good day, everyone. I'm Dan Day from the Office of Communications at Princeton University, welcoming you to today's live Google Hangout chat about the Ebola outbreak and what, how Princeton is involved in trying to mitigate this, uh, this terrible scourge in Africa today. With me today are two Princetonians involved uh, well, in, in anthropology. And uh, the first is Professor Jao Beal. He is a noted medical anthropologist uh, who has worked uh, over the world. Uh, he is the Susan Dodd Brown Professor of Anthropology at Princeton, where he is also the co-director of the program in global health and health policy. Also with us today from Boston, Massachusetts, is a 2013 graduate of Princeton, uh, an anthropology major, and Raphael Frankfurter. He also has a certificate in global health and health policy from Princeton. And in his professional life, he is the executive director of the Well Body Alliance. Uh, Rafi has just been in Sierra Leone within the last few weeks. And Rafi, what's the latest uh, over there on the Ebola outbreak? And, and what is the Well Body Alliance doing uh, with that situation? Um, so the situation is certainly not good and it's in fact gotten much worse in the past few weeks. Um, as of last night, there were 775 cases of Ebola in Sierra Leone and almost 300 people have died. Um, these are confirmed cases, so the number is probably much larger as there are likely hundreds of patients in their communities um, dying of the disease. Um, there's now Ebola in all but one district of the country, so the region that we work in, in the Far East, um, Kono District, had its first Ebola case about two weeks ago. Um, so our organization, we run a large medical center um, in Kono District, so our, our focus has really been on coordinating the response um, in that region, which is also a very neglected region far from the capital, and there's been much less attention on preparing and responding to the outbreak um, in Kono. So we, um, we're bringing a large number of materials into the country, um, protective equipment and drugs. We had one of the largest um, airlifts yet of uh, almost $350,000 worth of drugs and equipment um, brought to our clinic last week, um, and we have two more shipments on the way. And we're going to be distributing these nationally to clinics in all regions of the country to protect health workers um, from the disease and also to strengthen the um, isolation and referral system for Ebola patients so that they can get good care and, and hopefully survive the disease. Um, within Kona, we're also playing a, um, a large role in, in uh, conducting contact tracing on the community level. So we have a large network of community health workers attached to our clinic who are trained in um, recruiting people to clinics, counseling them about um, diseases and have strong ties to their villages. So these, um, this core of community health workers have been mobilized to go out after an Ebola patient is identified um, and interview people in the community, um, meet and try to identify contacts of the patient and then very empathetically counsel these people to get tested early for Ebola, both so that they have a higher chance of survival if they get treatment early, but also so that they don't um, spread it to their families and communities. Okay, now Rafi, you got involved uh, in Sierra Leone as a student at Princeton. Our, our, our informal motto here at the university is in the nation's service and in the service of all nations. And you started serving in Sierra Leone as a student. Perhaps you could talk about that. And I know that Professor Beale was your thesis advisor here at Princeton. Perhaps the two of us, you could talk about how you went from a student in the United States to becoming someone working on an international health crisis and how <laughs> Princeton played a role in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I, I uh, was fortunate to get a Princeton Health Grand Challenges grant to go to Sierra Leone and conduct um, ethnographic research advised by Professor Beale and Dr. Peter Locke, who was a postdoc at the time um, in Sierra Leone the summer after my freshman year. Um, and I was sort of affiliated with Well Body Alliance at the time as an intern, but also um, supported by Princeton in, in conducting the research and received pretty intensive mentorship from Professor Beal. Um, when I returned after my freshman year, I was really um, ready to, to volunteer for the organization and try to help it grow um, into a, a major healthcare facility. So I um, began volunteering from the U.S., fundraising, coordinating support and volunteers, um, and I received support from Princeton to return to Sierra Leone to Kono um, every summer since then. 
um, and I continued volunteering during the school year. So as your, you know, as I got more involved and kept going back to the organization, um, grew substantially into really one of the major healthcare organizations in the entire country, and um, we were ready to hire a full-time U.S.-based staff my senior spring. Um, and I also was fortunate to win the Bob Ruiz Fellowship, um, which is uh, one of Princeton's postgraduate fellowships for international service. So I was able to step into a full-time position, both uh, splitting my time between Well Body's new office in Boston, but also I spent about 40% uh, of the last year in Syria as well. Great. Professor Bale? Uh, yes, yes, let, let, let me take in. Thanks so much, uh, Dan, for, for producing and moderating this, and it, it's so nice to to be uh, to be with Rafi uh, discussing this you know this timely and uh, critical uh, issue you know Rafi uh, while you were doing uh, your research and, and working in Sierra Leone you know like um, we were always so deeply impressed by your involvement with local uh, community organizations you know with people uh, who are patients uh, of the clinic, but also your work together, you know, with with Dan Kelly and Dr. Baylor Barry, who is the physician uh, who who helped to to create the organization Well Body. And I, and somehow when I hear you now uh, having such a strong and important public voice, making the case, you know, that we have to attend to to local dynamics on the ground, community dynamics, to really get a, a sense of what's at stake for people and how to craft an intervention that it's meaningful and significant to them and hopefully can halt you know the the, the, the spread of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of the virus and, uh, and, and, and and put a halt on, on, on dying uh, unnecessary dying and I, so, so it would be helpful if you would tell us a little bit more about how this return to the field, this participant observation over time with communities, how has that informed your perception and your take of the epidemic, as well as what you have learned in the Global Health Program, where, which we have, we have an interdisciplinary training where we juggle social science with, uh, with uh, some knowledge in the basic sciences, the natural science, the life sciences, but also, you know, some focus on policy. So how did that interdisciplinary knowledge and the anthropological sensibility and methodology form your take, you know, and, and uh, which became visible yesterday in the New York Times. You know, the front page of the New York Times has a report on as doctors retreat for safety, Ebola fight in Africa grows harder. And you are cited and your position there stands out as one of, of not necessarily demonizing people, not making, not portraying people as as uh, as ignorant, as incapable of action, and so your stance is a people-centered stance, and it stands out in the way the Ebola has been narrated, and and that of course informs you know how how interventions are cast. Yeah, um, so my research over. Uh, three summers in Kono kind of broadly focused on um, the ways that people in, in the region who are often extremely poor have chronic painful disease and conditions. Um, the ways they, they seek out care from both local healers and also NGO um, clinics, the way that they um, understand illness and the sort of values that matter to them. Um, within healthcare, um, values like having a long-term relationship with healthcare providers. This is something that um, I learned from my anthropology research that traditional healers are, are very good at in a way that um, nurses often aren't. It's developing a very good, close relationship with, uh, with their patients, um, being given a very concrete understanding of what's happening to them um, so that you know, often people are not satisfied when they go to clinics. Um, that they're given a sort of diagnosis, a language for their illness that they don't really understand and has no meaning to them, whereas maybe a traditional healer would say this is a result of a curse that someone that you angered and you feel guilty about angering a long time ago um, uh, you know, has, has cast upon you. So um, I think that you know, my insights on, on um, 
these things came out of my opportunity to have a very long-term engagement there because these are kind of very deep cultural processes, intimate processes of, of illness, of the way people understand their health, what matters to them. And um, I, you know, I developed some very strong relationships with patients, with healers, with nurses. And, um, over time, and saw how things changed on the ground and this this really sort of nuanced my, my knowledge of what's going on. And I think, you know, this is a particularly relevant thing for the Ebola outbreak because the number one challenge, in addition to the lack of supplies, which is always a challenge in Sierra Leone, is that um, the, the number of people um, hiding or refusing to come to clinics or, um, you know, dying of this disease in their communities is, is enormous, and it's probably the number one thing that's spreading the the disease. Um, people have not found a way to get people when they present with the illness to come to clinics to isolate um, and to, uh, to to sort of accept impending death apart from their family members without any human contact. And um, this has been kind of widely interpreted within the country and within the international media um, as either resulting from ignorance that people simply don't understand um, you know, what, what this disease is and how it can be spread. So while I was in Sierra Leone, I saw um, Ebola parades, Ebola posters, Ebola banners, Ebola radio programs, Ebola songs, uh, people going to the market with loudspeakers talking about Ebola. My, under, my, my belief is that people really, they understand what Ebola is and they understand uh, how they can prevent it. Um, the other way that this is being interpreted as a result of culture, that people are sort of have these harmful beliefs and they're unwilling to accept Western medicine and so you know, they're just going to have to, a lot of them are going to have to die before they come to accept, uh, accept the messages that are being given to them. Um, you know, my sense and feeling that it's important to attend to people's, um, you know, values within healthcare has led me to kind of really think about and study the way that messages are being communicated to patients about Ebola. Um, now, when you ask someone to, basically the response is centered around people who present to clinics with the symptoms of an ordinary illness, um, you know, vomiting, fever, these are, you know, symptoms that many people experience multiple times throughout the year in Sierra Leone because malaria is endemic, typhoid is endemic. Um, they are being told that they're having a blood test done that they don't understand what's happening, the blood gets sent off to a lab, and then the nurse comes and says, you have Ebola. Um, you need to not touch any of your family. You need to, um, I can't touch you. We're going to have an ambulance come with a bunch of people that are dressed like they're astronauts in spacesuits, and they're going to throw you in the ambulance, and you're going to be sent off to a far-off hospital where you're probably going to die, and you're probably never going to see your family again, and you um, are probably never going to even have human contact again. And... This is an incredibly intense emotional process. It would be for us in the States as it is in Sierra Leone. It's a matter of confronting death and, and accepting that death is going to come and you know, you're not going to see your loved ones ever again. Um, now, I think that it would be possible, as we do in the States, to um, humanely and patiently counsel patients on why this is important. Um, you know, often when people receive very bad news, the first thing they do is try to deny it. Um, but we kind of, you know, it's a sort of an expectation when someone's told they have uh, terminal cancer or another disease like that in the States that someone's going to be at their side saying, I know this is hard to accept. I know this hurts. And I know, you know, this is, you may not be able to believe it right now if you don't feel like you're going to die, but you need to accept this in order to, uh, you know, to, to make yeah. you have a painless relatively painless death and uh, and keep your family safe and those types of conversations aren't happening on the ground um, as patients continue to leave facilities and uh, you know deny that they have the disease or uh, return to their families to be cared for at home and spread the disease this is being met with more and more confrontation um, the response is being increasingly militarized so that houses that have been identified as um, contacts of patients are being surrounded by police and soldiers for up to three weeks, um, and there's no sort of convergence of mutual understanding. These villagers are incredibly scared, and what they value is communication and a relationship and care, and, uh, and the Ebola response is centered around urgently sort of sending people off to hospitals to die where they won't um, ever see their families again, and 
you know, there has to be some sort of collaborative and respectful communication that happens in order to, uh, you know, for the situation to change. We have the uh, uh, the ability uh, for those of who are, are watching to pose questions to us uh, through the Google Hangout format. So if you have a question, you're welcome to type it in. We do have one uh, question already from a viewer in Singapore, and uh, it, uh, Rafi, I, uh, it's it's is is Ebola region specific? So uh, Ebola has typically only been found in eastern and central Africa, primarily in the Congo. Um, this is the first outbreak that's ever happened in at a large scale in West Africa. So originally, the region that it was supposed to be specific to was East and Central Africa, and now um, you know this uh, this is happening in West Africa. And kind of the big elephant in the room in all these conversations about Ebola is: is this now going to be a recurring problem? Is this now an endemic condition in West Africa? And if things have gotten so out of control this time, when finally things are you know uh, stabilized, how how is this going to be? Uh, Prevented in the future from spiraling out of control, but it's it's certainly only within Africa. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Dan and and Rafi, sorry, I was I was I was cut out for some time. I mm -hmm. so I missed part of your last uh, uh, um, part of the conversation. But can I jump in now? Yes, absolutely. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, 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 so Rafi. Um, um, the last thing I heard when you were talking about how local practices of grieving and death, you know, how are the influence and dynamics of the epidemic and how important it is to attend that. And in some ways we are calling for a cer certain sense share, if not of humanity, but like of human practices worldwide around death and dying that are at yeah. stake here and restoring some kind of like a humanity to these people and social relations, you know, to, to, the, to the understanding of them, not just as carriers or potential carriers of disease. But, but one thing that I, I don't know if you spoke uh, in the last segment, something that would be interesting to hear from you too is like how are people's reaction related to previous public health interventions? And mm -hmm. have they somehow, are they somehow critiquing in their response what has happened previously, both in terms of, uh, of imposed interventions or failed interventions? Yeah, um, I think that's a good, an excellent question that you know many people are bringing up in the country. One, um, you know, within Sierra Leone, a major public health issue that has long been discussed and uh, and you know tried to be rectified is there are really low rates of clinic attendance. So nation nationwide, um, seventy five percent of women. Um, Sorry, phone's ringing, but 75% uh, of women deliver um, at home under the care of a traditional birth attendant, and um, only 25% deliver in facilities, and um, very low numbers of, of, of children relative to the disease burden actually attend clinics as well. Um, so, you know, there have been a number of ways that the government's tried to um, increase the number of people that go to clinics. For instance, they completely abolished user fees um, to clinics in 2010 for pregnant women and children under five, which was considered a very progressive um, policy within Africa because the idea was that people don't attend clinics simply because they have to pay for them. Um, and in fact, the um, attendance rates have hardly budged at all since that happened. So to us at WellBody and to me as a researcher, this was an indication that people are not sort of receiving the type of care that they, you know, desire out of the healthcare interaction at a clinic um, and, uh, and are instead choosing to go to traditional birth attendants or traditional healers because they're providing a better form of care, whatever, you know, they're not providing medicine that will save their lives, but they're providing something else. That's communication. That's a long-term relationship. Um, this is the exact same thing that's happening now is that people are turning inwards to their communities because they feel like they're going to receive better care from their family members and from local healers um, when they have Ebola than when they go and are whisked into an ambulance by a bunch of men in white suits. And yet here the stakes are much higher because that is what is uh, continuing the spread of the disease. So mm -hmm. to me this is very in line with, uh, with the you know, public health themes and issues that have been happening in Sierra Leone for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and uh, Raf, if you could tell us a little bit more about this this application of a cordon sanitaire 
in yeah. around affected areas, the use of the military in the response. And, uh, and, and if I recall well, you know, this, is, this was like an early 20th century, you know, um, you know, technique, you know, I recall the yeah. 1918 uh, attempt to stop a typhus outbreak on the Russian Polish border, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so could you tell us a little bit more about the use of such forceful tactics in responding to the outbreak? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and how are people taking that up? And, and what are the pros and cons of that response? Yeah, yeah so the, the military response started about two weeks ago when the president declared a state of emergency. And that was after um, things really fell apart about two weeks ago. For, for most of the summer, this was contained to a small region of Kailau District, um, which is very remote. And then um, when Sierra Leone's chief Ebola doctor died, Dr. Khan, um, everything sort of fell apart. The healthcare system began to fall apart. Many patients returned to their communities. And um, so President Karoma of Sierra Leone um, has, has sort of militarized the response and created these very large quarantine areas um, around sort of epicenters, but also um, ordered that houses of Ebola patients or contacts are quarantined by soldiers and police officers for 21 days. And on the one hand, I mean, this certainly does warrant an aggressive response, and things may be so out of control that, um, you know, this is all that we can do at this point, is sort of cordon off areas, let the disease fizzle out, have a lot of people die, but, um, you know, that's kind of what's needed. On the other hand, um, you know, we had our first case in Kono two weeks ago. There were two houses connected to the case in downtown Koidu City, which is a very public area and um, completely surrounded by police officers. And that is certainly not going to um, sort of, it's going to dissuade people in the next house over from going to clinics if, you know, proactively if they think they might have Ebola because it's, it's shameful um, until several days into the quarantine. They weren't sure how it was going to, how, how food was going to be um, provided to these these households. And, uh, you know, this is all tempered by the fact that one of our staff actually saw someone um, from the house hanging out in the center of town three days after the quarantine started. So there's some questions about how effective the quarantines actually are, but this big display of military might um, is not contributing to a more respectful and collaborative response between Communities and health workers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then, and then uh, Rafi, you, you you were there recently, and you came back, and in the piece that came out yesterday in the New York Times, it mentions you know that uh, that you somehow reluctantly, but you know, but you had to leave somehow. There's this issue of fear. There's this issue of of uh, of of, um, of then who is left behind, and we know that uh, as until recently, Dr. Baylor, your your your, your yeah. partner, you know the the, the phys, you know the, the 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 Sierra Leonean doctor who helped to to create the organization, who and who is now doing a master's degree in global health and in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard. He was there. Is he still there? And and uh, and, and how how do health workers cope with this question of of fear and of yeah. their own fear of infection and of potential death. Yeah. Um, so our doctor, uh, doctor, one of our doctors, Dr. Barry, um, he is, he's not in Sierra Leone right now. He's evacuating his family to the States and then he's going to return. Um, mm -hmm. But we still do have uh, all of our clinical staff, so that's about mm -hmm. 50 people and then a network of community health workers. Um, we had to make some tough calls this week because very large numbers of um, health workers are contracting the disease even with um, protective equipment, which has raised questions about, you know, whether this strain is sticking on the gloves and gowns more than other strains. Um, and so you really need to be, you know, absolutely sure of the protocol for removing protective equipment. So um, meantime, our American co-founder, Dr. Kelly, received pretty rigorous training in um, infection control protocols, and he just left for Sierra Leone yesterday. So we've sort of kept, uh, we've, we've had to sort of temporarily stop our clinical services simply because it seemed too, um, too, too risky without having that kind of rigorous mm -hmm. protocols in place, even though we now have the equipment um, to, mm -hmm. to keep having our 
health workers see patients. And so the clinic will be reopened on Thursday. In the meantime, we're kind of operating out of the government hospital um, mm -hmm. after after Dr. Kelly conducts some trainings. But I'd say, you know, in general, um, it's this, you know, our staff really, really want to play a part in the outbreak. They feel like this is a... Uh, <laughs> You know, a real threat to their communities and families, and as health workers, they have the skills and capacity to play a big role in the response. Um, on the same, at the same time, there have been now up to f almost 50 health workers who died of this disease in Sierra Leone, and so that's actually a significant number of health workers in the country. That's a major blow to um, a healthcare system that's already really stretched in terms of human resources. Um, so, you know, this is it's it's tough because this is a disease where if you do a bad job trying to help with Ebola, it's worse than doing no job at all, perhaps, because it's so so deadly and so contagious. On the other hand, we do feel like uh, once we set up the protocols, we can really um, play a safe and, and big role in the response to the clinic. So, 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 Raf, you mentioned yeah. briefly, no, this, this is the same part, and I was saying, and, you know, what you're doing and the organization is doing, uh, you mentioned something about uh, the strain of this virus. So, so can you tell us a little bit more, what do we know about the biological aspects of this disease? Is this, is this a new strain of the virus, or how, how is that playing out? So, the, so there, kind of there was done on that front. Yeah, there was a, um, an article last week in the New England Journal of Medicine which suggested that this is a totally new strain of the virus. Um, some interesting things about it is that the majority of patients are not hemorrhaging, so usually, um, you know, it's very clear who has Ebola because they're bleeding. Um, and these people in Sierra Leone, many of them are not. Many of them just have diarrhea and vomiting, which makes it much more difficult to identify and much sort of easier for patients to feel like there's no way that they actually have a disease that's going to kill them within a matter of days. Um, it's also killed a kind of incredible number of health workers, including and infected really, really highly skilled and equipped doctors like Dr. Khan in Sierra Leone, the two American doctors who were working in Liberia, um, which, uh, you know, there are a number of reasons why that could be. People are inexperienced, obviously, dealing with Ebola, mm -hmm. and um, they, you know, maybe didn't stick to protocol entirely, but this is clearly a, a really infectious strain. And then the last thing is that um, the mortality rate within for patients who go to clinics is around um, 60 percent, so lower than in other outbreaks, which is good, but it also means that people don't get sick as fast and so have the opportunity to spread it to more uh, greater numbers of people. So that has also kind of facilitated the, the spread mm -hmm. of the disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we do have a question. Is it, is it incurable? Uh, well, you can recover from the disease. Um, the treatment is supportive. It's you know replacing fluids, treating bleeding as it happens, providing antibiotics and anti-malarials if needed. So you know, as I said, up to 40% of people are uh, recovering, but there is no cure for the disease right now. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so, so uh, can I can I make another question or point or brief comment? Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, so, so Rafi, this is just it's absolutely, you know, just, you know, terrific and so important and vital work that you're doing and, you know, and, and we're absolutely proud of you and, 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 and of the work that the organization is doing there. And, I, and, and, and somehow, if, if you could help us to think a little bit more of, about you also as a representative of this new generation of, um, of cosmopolitan Global Health scholars, Princeton Global scholars, like, tell us a bit more of what these challenges on the ground are telling you that your generation has to attend to and and get yeah. involved into both you know medical, scientifically, social, scientifically, politically to make a difference in this world of global health. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of the the bottom line of the problem uh, that's contributing, the bottom line, what's contributing to uh, to these very difficult community level problems of uh, people not going to clinics is that they're not really being humanized by um, health workers and by even public health experts who continue to uh, to talk about how we need 
you know, culturally sensitive responses, but not really empathetic responses. Or um, we need to be more aggressive about quarantining, but not really, there's no sort of shared reciprocal sort of understanding that these are people confronting horrible um, realities, uh, confronting imminent death, which, uh, you know, we, really pains us every time we read about someone confronting imminent death in the States, if it's cancer or if it's something else, and we kind of have an idea of the type of humanistic care they should be provided, but, um, but, but that's not really being prioritized because this is such an urgent problem and, uh, and you, know, you know, warrants a very aggressive response. And I think that, for me, my um, initial inclination to, to think about the human side of this issue, um, not, not just the numbers, not just the fear, not just the biology, but that these are real people experiencing something terrifying that I certainly hope I never have to experience. Um, you know, that came from my, you know, extended field work um, coupled with kind of anthropological critical reflection and writing at Princeton. And I think that, um, you know, the, the trend among Princeton students to conduct field work and also to critically reflect will hopefully sort of rehumanize these subjects of global health um, in a way that will yield an, a more humane form of response to something this urgent, something like a crisis like this, or just health systems development, um, which is you know what we've been working on this early on for six years. Right. Rafi, we have yes. one one more question. This is probably the last one we'll be able to take uh, from a, a viewer. Why are test drugs developed in the USA not being made widely available? Uh, well, so the first reason for that is that the one test drug that there is is uh, in extremely limited supply, so I believe there are only 12 doses left. Um, the other, you know, there's a big um, New York Times article about the decision not to treat the Sierra Leonean doctor with this test drug um, who had fallen ill with the disease. And um, the, the tricky thing is that if, um, given the degree of confrontation and suspicion and and uh, you know the, the very tense dynamic between health workers and patients. The fear was that if um, they were to start providing this test drug, an American test drug, and it were to sort of in the patient were to die, and it word were to get out that American test drugs were um, killing patients, uh, that could really contribute in a very dangerous way to the spread of the disease. Now there too, if that were to have happened and someone were to have honestly engaged communities and said, look, like, you know, given them the capacity to understand the situation, you know, we have this drug, we weren't sure if it was going to work, we don't know if it was Ebola or the drug that killed the person, we're doing the best we can and we do the same for you. If everything slowed down and patients and community members were treated as sort of human and able to have a dynamic interaction like that, I think that, that risk could have been mitigated as well. Um, but, but that's not really how the response is being orchestrated right now. Okay. Uh, Professor Beal, any last questions for Rafi? You know, I, I just, it, it's not a question. I just want to, to basically say yes to what Rafi was saying about uh, the need to rehumanize um, the subjects of, uh, of interventions and, uh, and to try to get uh, close to them and, and understand them in their own terms and so that they also feel uh, empowered to draw from their own resources that they have to 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 become agents and uh, uh, in the in in the interventions and not simple passive recipients and uh, and, and 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 I think this call to rehumanize both you know social science and to rehumanize policy and to rehumanize care is just of utmost significance and I'm this younger generation and Rafi knows that I. I have been saying this all along, you know, how to juggle between understanding and doing and uh, without becoming cynical or with withdrawing in one only of those poles, you know, this combined involvement with people on the ground over time, trying to understand lives entangled in monies, policies, technologies, disasters, and at the same time trying to carve alternatives with them of what might work. And, um, and and I think this is deeply inspiring the work that Rafi and the Well Body Alliance is doing, and I just um, you know and and um, 
and in some ways what I can say more power uh, to this generation to, to think along those lines and I'm deeply happy that Princeton has been able through the global health and health policy program and uh, to, to create this, this, this space for critical thinking that does not discourage doing and, uh, and doing it with people in the world. So thank you, Rafi. And Rafi, uh, any last words from you? If, if someone wants to learn more about the Well Body Alliance uh, or get involved in some way, what, what can you tell them? Yeah, um, our website is www.wellbodyalliance.org. Um, you know, we can uh, could use all the help we can get right now. This is an uh, enormous amount of work and a big shift from our normal operations, so we'd love to hear from you, and you can contact us through that website. Um, yeah, I also just want to say thank you. Um, thank you to Professor Veal and you, Daniel, and, and, and to Princeton for kind of, I feel like a, a lot was invested in me and, and uh, both giving me the experience to conduct field work but also to kind of critically reflect on it in a way uh, that, um, that Professor Beale was just talking about and so that kind of very pragmatically I got this position through Princeton but also intellectually uh, the Global Health Program uh, really made me made me who I am and, and uh, you know my, my perspective on, on this disease and, and what's needed to stop it. So. Well, it's a fine story, Rafi. Thank you very much for sharing it with us and with our viewers. Professor Beal, thank you for your time and for the efforts you've put into global health issues uh, over the years. I know you're still still very much active uh, in your field. Uh, Rafi, thank you. And uh, thanks to all our viewers for joining us today from Princeton University. I'm Dan Day. Have a great day. Take care.